that's impossibility results in asynchronous shared memory systems in uh, this part of the talk. And I'm going to discuss two important techniques, covering arguments and valency arguments. So um, I first want to define what covering means. A process PI is said to cover a register R in a configuration C if PI writes to R whenever PI is next allocated the step by the scheduler. And the result of that write um, basically hides previous writes to R by other processes. Um, a block write is a sequence of consecutive steps by different processes in which they each write to a different register. Um, previous writes to the set of registers by other processes are hidden when this block write is performed. So the idea of a, a block write is, um, I think, best illustrated by the, um, the carnival game called Whack-A-Mole. Um, so this is a game where you have little moles that pop up um, on a board, and you have big um, mallets that are soft, and you have to hit the moles on the head. And the idea is, you, or at least one well-known strategy for doing well on this, is before they the, the moles pop up and then go back down again, and you want to hit them before they go down again. And so one of the well-known strategies for this is to t keep your mallets, I think you get two of them, um, over two holes. And so when the moles pop up, you're ready to whack them. So this is the notion of you're covering those two holes. So that's uh, <laughs> my favorite analogy for the notion of, a, of covering. So, so in a, when you, uh, when, if PI is covering a register R, it's still possible that the old value of R was read before PI Got allocated. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, what we're doing, it just we're saying what happens when, when the adversarial schedule or next schedule P, it will no. overwrite whatever is there. It'll just it's covering it now, and so it's ready to go and be hit when, when it, when something important like relevant information, really useful information happens to get written, then the adversary can say, ah, I'll get rid of that useful information. Bang. Okay. <laughs> okay so that's really how the adversary can use this. So that's that's the point. OK. So the goal of a covering argument is to construct a configuration in which all registers are covered. And then any execution alpha from this configuration C, if we have this execution here, um, can basically be hidden by the, a block write. OK, so what we have is if we have this block write, then we can have some other uh, execution going on after that. Um, and even if this execution takes place, since whatever, whatever information it writes is going to be overwritten by this block write to every register, um, the same execution here can take place here as well as here. So that's the, the main idea of the intuition about how such arguments go. And then there's lots of, diff there's lots of details to get that to work. Registers are all the pieces of memory, or this is some subset. <coughs> well, so okay, so let me we'll get to that in a second. Yeah. So um, all right. So um, okay. So we want to construct this configuration, which all are um, covered, um, and this can be used at, um, to show that any asynchronous algorithm using too few registers um, can behave in correct correctly. And so, in fact, we don't, it doesn't even matter how big the registers are, it's just the number of registers. Okay? And basically, the construction is inductive, um, with the number of covered objects increasing as the argument progresses. So we start with nothing being covered, and then we show that one will be covered, and then we can get a configuration where there are two, et cetera, until we have um, everything being covered. Okay. So in order to illustrate this technique, I'm going to present the following result uh, due to Burns and Lynch, which is that any mutual exclusion algorithm for two or more processes uses at least n registers. And in fact, covering algor algorithm or covering arguments were first introduced in this particular lower bound. Okay, now the model I'm going to consider is an asynchronous shared memory system in which every process has a distinct ID. Um, processes communicate through shared um, read-write registers of unbounded size. So I'm just emphasizing that we only do reads and writes. And there are no faults. Okay, so pretty basic kind of model. Okay. All right, so what's the mutual exclusion problem? Because I promised this, this uh, talk re uh, required no background in uh, distributed computing. So this problem models the situation in which processes need temporary exclusive access to a shared resource, for example, a shared printer. Okay, we only want to print one thing at a time. Um, I don't want some, you know, some of your uh, print job and my print job to be mixed up in the same page. Not very useful. Okay, 
So to get the resource, a process performs an entry protocol. Okay, each process has some protocol that it's going to follow. And when a process is finished using the resource, it performs an exit protocol. Um, and a process is said to be idle if it doesn't have the resource and it's not performing the um, and its entry or exit protocol. Okay, so there's sort of um, the sort of four states a process can be in: either idle, then it, if it decides it wants to use the resource, it goes into its entry protocol. Uh, eventually, we hope that it gets the resource, and then once it's finished, it goes does its exit protocol and then becomes idle again. Okay, and. Um, when we have a, an idle process, we, we're considering it to um, not cover any process. Sorry, to not cover any register, OK? So um, it, it basically has to have somehow from the outside the, or whatever other things it's doing, the, the necessity for um, needing the resource. And then it starts doing the entry protocol. So we say that I, I, an idle process isn't covering any register. OK. All right. Um, now, a mutual exclusion algorithm consists of entry and exit protocols for each process that satisfy two different conditions. The first is mutual ex exclusion, which says that in any configuration, at most one process has the resource. Okay, so we're not both printing at the same time. And the second is deadlock freedom, which basically says we're never in a situation where no progress can be made. So what this, more precisely this says, starting from any configuration C in which some process is performing its entry protocol, okay, and no process has the resource, so there's something that we want to have happen, okay. There is a finite execution by processes that are not idle in C, okay, so if you're idle, you don't care, you're not really part of it, um, which causes some process to get the resource, okay. We're not saying that every process is necessarily going to have its request satisfied, um, but just that the system as a whole is going to make progress. That, um, Infinitely, if, the, if this um, goes on for infinitely often, then infinitely often processes are going to get resources. Okay, assuming that they once they finish the resource, they give it up. Okay. And yeah, we don't want to have faults because if a process has the result, the um, the resource, and then crashes, then nobody else is going to get the resource. So that's why we basically ignore faults in this in this problem. Okay. Um, so what we want to do is, um, in order to prove the theorem, I'm going to prove two lemmas. And um, the first lemma is the following, OK? It's going to be using a covering argument. Um, it, OK, so it, it says that suppose that alpha is a finite execution by some process pi starting from configuration C. And pi is idle in C, OK, here. And in the, when it performs ex, uh, the execution alpha, OK, this finite execution where it's only taking steps. Um, eventually, it's um, going to have the resource. So suppose this happens. OK, we're not saying it will, but if it, this does. And let's let R be the set of registers that are covered in C. OK, then what we know is that during alpha, PI must write to some register that's not in R. OK, and we're going to prove that. Like always, this is a proof by contradiction. Okay, so suppose we're in this situation, and um, suppose that process uh, P only writes to registers in R. Okay, um, now what we're going to do, so we look at this block write beta, okay, because R is covered, we can have, perform a block write here. Okay, and we can also, so these are just writes, so these, pro, these, are, these are only steps by process PI, so all the other processes, okay, that are covering um, the PI is idle, so it's not covering anything in C. And all the other processes can still perform the writes from this configuration as well. <coughs> okay, so these, these two configurations are indistinguishable to, um, to every other process besides process PI. Okay, and now um, let's look at the situation here. Well, what we can say is, um, OK, so what we can say is that from this configuration here, by the deadlock freedom property, it's possible for some, um, there, there are some processes that are, um, are not idle. And either there's some process that has the, has the resource, or there is, um, it's possible that some processes can pr perform steps, and eventually um, some process um, has the resource. 
Okay, so that we have that here. Now let's look at, at the situation over here. So we have some process PJ that has the resource over here. Okay, now this same execution, okay, the, these these steps do not involve process PI because PI is idle. And deadlock freedom says we don't have to involve idle processes in this. Okay, so we can perform exactly the same execution starting from here as we did from here because these are indistinguishable. Okay, but now let's look at what happens. Here we know that process PI has the resource, and here we know that process PJ has the resource. And so in this configuration, process PI and PJ both have the resource, and hence we have a problem. Okay, we've shown that the algorithm is incorrect. Questions? Good. Okay, so um, the second lemma we want to prove is the following. Um, okay, but b before we do that, is this one here. Uh, I've written lemma one up on the board because we'll have to refer to it later on. Okay, so we say that a, conf a configuration is quiescent if every process is idle. Okay, so it's... Now it's this, and in fact, the initial configuration is going to be quiescent. Okay, so nothing's happening at the beginning. Okay, so suppose we have a quiescent configuration Q, and um, then we can prove that from any from um, configuration Q for all k between one and n, there are executions sigma and delta such that if we start in Q and perform delta, we get uh, end up at a, a quiescent. Uh, configuration again. Okay, so all the processes are idle. Um, we have the fact that all the registers have the same value in this configuration Q sigma and Q delta. So after performing sigma and performing delta, all process, all the registers have the same value. Okay, um, in configuration Q sigma, um, the first k processes P0 through k through PK minus one all cover different registers, and finally. Um, these two configurations, Q sigma and Q delta, are indistinguishable to all the other processes, PK through PN minus one. Okay, so we're going to prove this lemma. Well, okay, but before we prove that, we'll prove the theorem. Um, so the theorem says any mutual exclusion algorithm for N processes uses at least N registers. So we know that the initial configuration is quite quiescent. Let's apply uh, lemma two with K equals N. Um, so there is a, uh, we get to an ex, um, configuration where n minus one process, so n processes cover n different registers, um, and hence uh, we need at least n registers for our algorithm. Okay. So this is this lemma itself is the the workhorse that we have to do. So and essentially. By virtue of the fact that there was a line which said there are k different registers. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> they cover k different, for each k, yeah, in particular for n we can get that. So what we're basically, we'll show that basically we'll start from, uh, this will be an induction, and we'll build this up, and, and as long as um, k is, uh, is less than n, we can extend the induction one more step. Okay, so that's really what's, what's happening. Okay, so the proof of lemma two is by induction on k, and the base case is k equals one. Okay, so um, so by deadlock freedom, there's an execution of alpha by p naught in which um, p naught gets the resource. So we're we're starting this uh, quiescent configuration, and process p naught all of a sudden now says, "I want to start. Um, I've been the only non-idle process. I would like the resource." And so from that configuration, not necessarily from Q, but this one additional step when it decides what it wants to do, that it wants this. So it can, it's the only non-idle process, so eventually you can run it, and um, there's some execution in which P, P0 gets the resource, okay? And by lemma one, during this execution alpha, P has to write to some register, okay? Well, because in, in the configuration Q, um, okay, there's nothing covered, so we, we have to write to something that um, Okay, we're starting from some configuration Q in which nothing is covered, okay? Um, and so it's gonna write to some register. So um, what we're gonna do is look at the longest pre prefix of alpha that contains no writes, okay? So there is gonna be at least one write in the sigma, and we, um, so in alpha, and we take sigma to be the longest prefix that contains no writes. And um, so what we're gonna do is sigma is gonna be that, and delta is gonna be the empty execution. Okay, so let's see what's happening. Well, 
first of all, um, uh, since Q is, um, is quiescent and Q de and delta is the empty execution, certainly Q delta is quiescent. Um, now, all registers have the same values in these two. Well, none of the registers have changed here. But in fact, during sigma, there weren't any writes, so none of the registers have changed value here. Okay, so that's still okay. Um, P covers one register in Q sigma because we're letting it run until it's just about to write, so it's covering something. When it next it allocated the step, it'll write, because that's we, we took sigma to be, um, to, to make that happen. And Q sigma and Q delta are indistinguishable to all other processes. Well, nothing else has been written, so um, there's, there, nothing else has happened. None of the other ones have taken steps, so they have no way of getting any information about what's happening. So as far as they're concerned, um, they can't see what process um, P0 has done, and so we're done. Okay, so that's, that's the easy base case. Okay, so for our induction step, um, let's let K um, be uh, less than, this was supposed to be n, um, and assume the claim is true for R. So by the induction hypothesis, for, from any con um, quiescent configuration QT, there are executions sigma T and delta T that satisfy the claim. Okay? Um, now, we know that um, this is quiescent, this configuration is quiescent, and these two um, Configurations are indistinguishable to all other processes, okay, besides um, P0 to um, P K minus 1. So they, um, we know that they're, um, they're idle in this configuration. Okay, so what we're going to do is consider, okay, so rem remember that in, um, in QT sigma T, uh, so satisfying the claim, okay, um, they, they cover different registers. And so let's beta t be the block write by these processes starting from this configuration. Okay, so they're, they're covering them. We can do the block write. Um, and now let's consider, after that block write, let's let gamma t be a finite execution by those processes that, um, that results in a, a quiescence configuration. So basically what's happening is, um, I mean, these are the only, everything else is idle. These processes do their block writes, and we're going to let one of them, by deadlock freedom, one of them will be able to um, go to the entry, do its entry section, get the resource, and then we let it go away and then become idle, and then we let another one go, and eventually there's an execution in which all of them are idle. Okay, so that's what we have here with this gamma t. Okay, we just let the, all of the rest of them finish up, so we're back into a quiescent configuration. So this is what we have here, okay? So we start with Q being Q1, and we apply this, and we have the delta 1 going down to quiescent, and we have this sigma 1, beta 1, delta gamma 1 going to another quiescent configuration, Q2. And from Q2, again, we have a delta 2 and um, sigma 2, beta 2, gamma 2, okay? So we could do what we just did on the same, on the previous slide over and over and over again. Yes. I'm sorry. Could you explain again why such a gamma team must exist? Okay. So what we have. So all right, let me go back there. Okay. So we've done the block. So all the other processes are idle, mm -hmm. and now what we have is um, we have these. The first K, K processes um, are doing a block write. So they're doing something. They're not idle. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they might be in their doing their exit uh, protocol, their entry protocol. Um, and so eventually, what we, by deadlock freedom, we know that from this configuration, either there's something, someone, one of the, there's a pro, there must be a process that'll eventually get the resource, okay? And then we let the pro, that process finish with its ex resource and finish its exit protocol. Uh, oh, do we know that it will eventually finish with the... The exit protocol, yes. Okay, I mean, it's, it's in a, I didn't actually put in all the, the requirements, oh, okay. but yes, but uh, I mean, exit protocol, the exit part usually is very easy, and I, this okay. wasn't... Uh, yeah, so that's going to happen. So we'll, we'll get that process, getting the resource, and then it finished with it, and then it'll become idle, okay? And then by deadlock freedom, we know if there's any other process there that is it still in its entry protocol, um, doing its entry protocol, we'll let one of those, eventually one of those has to have, get the resource. And again, we'll just repeat it. And we'll do, we can just do them one at a time, not letting any of the idle processes um, start their entry protocol. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, and then eventually they're all going to be done. Okay, so we've all finished printing our, uh, uh, the, you know, the final versions of our papers, and uh, we go, we're going home. <laughs> okay, and we're not going to do a second one. Okay, so that's we're we're there. Okay, so we have this this nice set setup where we're ending up with all these circles are are quiescent configurations. Okay, now um, by the pigeonhole principle, there exists a t less than t prime such that beta t and beta t prime are block rights to the same set of k, of k registers R. Okay, so we only, um, we're, we're assuming that, um, let's say we have, um, we're, I mean, if we had more than n reg registers to begin with, um, I mean, you know, we have, we have our theorems, so we're, we're assuming that we have at most n registers. And so, you know, there's only a finite number of registers, and we're writing to k of them so that, Eventually, if we have n choose k plus one of these things, um, two of these will write to the same set of, of registers. Okay. So, um, all right. So now let's look at um, that that t here. Okay, the first of these, and um, since it's quiescent, this thing down here, there's some sort of finite execution alpha by p k starting from from there, such that p k has the resource. Um, at the end of that execution. So we're just letting that one go by itself. Okay. Um, now let's look at these two configurations, QT sigma T and QT delta T. Um, now they're indistinguishable to process PK. And all registers have the same values in these two configurations. That was part of our, um, there were some the uh, things that we got from the induction hypothesis. Okay. So we know that alpha can occur starting from this configuration as well as um, as uh, delta, delta t, um, so qt delta t. Okay, so it can start there because pk is um, is one of the registers. Um, it's not one of the first k registers. It's the k plus first register. Okay, um, so alpha can occur starting from that because these two are indistinguishable in this process pk, and um, since uh, pk has the resource after alpha starting when it starts from qk delta t, it also has the resource when it starts from qk sigma t. Okay, so we have that. So let's see that in the, in the, at the beginning of the next one. Okay, so we have we did look look at whatever the execution was that takes us to qt up at the top. I've put that there. Uh, and, and now, um, and then we have the sigma t there, okay, and um, okay, we have this, this, um, and then we have some additional, uh, let's see, we have this here, okay, so then we have the rest of this execution that takes us to qt prime, and I have this delta, this thing here that takes me to, um, oops, that was, yeah. Um, yeah, okay, so, yeah, so I, I, I have this additional uh, delta t, t prime that goes down here, and I have a sigma t prime that goes over here. Okay, so that's the setup, and we have this execution alpha I just talked about in the previous slide, okay, in which process pk is, only, is the only process taking steps. Okay, by lemma one, it's an execution in which process pk um, <coughs> is eventually going to um, get the resource. So by lemma one, during alpha, pk has to write to subregister not an R, okay? Because in, configura in this configuration up here, okay, the registers in R are covered, okay? That's what we knew, okay? Um, okay, so pk has to cover a register not an R. And since pt is a block right to R, um, each register has the same value um, after this block right here and after this block right here. Okay. Um, so the rest of that execution from here on and here on, okay, um, this one can take place. It took place over here. It can also take place over here because everything's the same and it's not involving any step. It's only involving steps of the first k minus one processes. Okay. Um, Okay, so that's what we have here. It's only starting, okay. So what we're going to do is define sigma. So sigma is going to be 
this whole execution here is going to go along here, come down here, go all the way here, and end up here. So that's my execution sigma. Okay. Um, and what I'm going to do for delta is I'm going to go along here, go all the way along here, and follow the delta prime, delta t prime down here to, and I'm going to call that delta. Okay. So in one case, I'm going for the sigma, I'm going along here. And for the delta, I'm going along here. OK. All right, so this is the situation we're in. I just sort of focused on that part. And we have our alpha. And so the diff there's this difference without this alpha prime. And there's the little difference at the end. OK, now let me show you that all of the, um, the requirements of the lemma, the four points that I have down at the bottom, OK, are on fact all satisfied. OK, Q delta is quiescent. Why? Well, QT, we were in QT, and we have had this execution de um, delta T prime, and that led to something that was quiescent. That was part of our induction hypothesis. So that one's good. Um, all registers have the same values in here and here. OK, so why is that? Well, we know that um, all registers have the same values here and here. OK, that was by the induction hypothesis. OK, um, we knew that QT sigma T prime and QT um, delta T prime, all the processes had the same, uh, all the registers had the same value. OK, and what we also know is that, OK, we don't have any, there's no, the write doesn't take place here. Was, all of the writes that are, this is the block right here, OK, and all the writes that took place in here were overwritten by this block write BT, because these were all only writes to, to R. And BT is a block write to R. So everything that was, all of the interesting stuff that PK did has been overwritten. And we stopped that execution. Um, we cut it off alpha at alpha prime before it did anything else outside. OK. And um, OK, so they all have the same, they have um, the same values. Um, here and here, and ends here and here. OK? And um, okay, what about P0 through PK? They cover K plus 1 different registers here. Well, they cover K different registers here. OK? And basically, they cover the registers in R. That was the definition of QT prime. OK? They also cover the same registers R over here. And PK covers some register that's not in R. OK, so that's uh, an additional register. There's, so there's K plus 1 different registers that the first K plus 1 processes cover. And these two um, configurations, Q sigma and Q delta, are indistinguishable to all other processes. Why? Well, these two configurations are indistinguishable to the first K processes, all but the first K processes, and these configurations here are indistinguishable to all processes except for P sub K. So in particular, this configure, this, um, this and this are uh, indistinguishable. These, th these um, two configurations are indistinguishable to process K plus 2 up to N minus 1. So what we have here is a proof of lemma 2, or at least a, a proof of the in induction step. And hence, we have um, lemma 2 proved. And as I said earlier, we have a proof of the theorem. Paul? So to, just to, for me to understand clearly, so for this proof of lemma 2, you're mm -hmm. applying lemma 1, creating intermediate uh, quiescent states sort of many, many times fall for all subset, like n choose k or whatever. Yeah, we're doing, um, yeah, so, so that we're doing this kind of thing, yes. Many, so, so each of those things is, you're, you're just doing one step of lemma two, and then you're uh, reapplying lemma one over and over again. You still haven't gotten that k plus first thing until you yeah, so got the, this spot much later. Yeah, so the important thing is we had to use the pitch and hole principle. We needed the same set r to be, um, to be in um, down here, okay. This the the set of things that were covered here. Oh, sorry. Um, we look at this point here. We had R R covered here, and we want to go to a later place where those same R covered, so that when we um, whatever we do going in delta T, we can also move it over into T prime. And so that's sort of what's happening. So we do this many many times. We apply we apply. Um, 
this, um, yeah, we apply the, the, the induction step of lemma two multiple times, and in each one, in any one of them, we can apply lemma one, but it's only going to be useful when we have um, the T and T prime so that they're covering the same set of registers. So these executions are very long, so it might be that if you're interested only in programs running uh, in real time, then you can do it with less registers. Yeah. This is, this is, okay, so this is a space lower bound. Okay, that's all we're caring about, the number of registers. I'm, this is not saying anything at all about time. Okay, and in fact, covering arguments typically are just used for space lower bounds. Um, there are some situations where you can do, where you can have space and time in fun, some funny ways, but... Uh, but you're only going to get even higher lower bounds if you limit the space, uh, limit yeah. the time, right? I mean, no, no. On the contrary, it might be that there is some algorithm which works as, as, as far as your algorithm that's only n to the 10 steps. And the first problem is that if you're doing n to the 10 steps plus 1. No, but I mean, OK. But no, that algorithm yeah, but, 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 but yeah, so we're, we have to guarantee mutual exclusion. And by, we know that in lemma 1, we're going to, by lemma 1, we're going to get this kind of thing. Okay, and the, one of the things that's important about mutual exclusion is it's a long-lived problem. Okay, we ex we expect that the printer isn't going to die, and that people are always going to have papers that they want to print. Okay, so if you're going to just if you're going to restrict it to say, well, we're looking at mutual exclusion where each process is going to access wants to uh, get the resource only once, then you might be able to have a more efficient algorithm. But that's not the case here. Okay, so we're looking at this long-lived problem that we're. Uh, once we've used a process and it, it's, it's got the resource and become idle again, we can use it again and again and again. And so it, it, it's, it's really crucial for this uh, particular result. Other questions? So this is one of the easier uh, covering arguments. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also a classic. It's the kind of thing that you would see in a, in a standard uh, introductory course. Okay. And that was okay. So that's the, the, the end of the claim. And now I'm going to. So if you got a little lost at the end, even so, we're going to switch completely to a, a different problem using a completely different technique. Okay. So um, what I want to now do is talk about valency arguments. So this is a completely different thing, and it's um, and what we're going to show is an impossibility result. Okay. And the problem we're going to consider is consensus. So consensus is <coughs> mutual exclusion, consensus, uh, leader election. Those are sort of main, some of the major building blocks in, uh, for distributed algorithms. And we study them over and over again because we have so many different models. And it really helps us, under, because they're so fundamental, it helps us understand the distinctions between <coughs> the models. Okay, it's not that I really care about consensus so much, but it's just a very nice uh, problem to work with. OK, so here's the um, sort of high-level diagrammatic view of consensus. Um, OK, um, so each process has an input. And uh, what we want to do is have all the non-faulty uh, processes uh, agree on the same output. And that output has to be one of the inputs. OK, so that's, um, this is a, stand, a standard picture for that. OK, so more formally, each process PI has a private uh, input value vi, and um, each non-faulty process has to output a value after taking a finite number of steps. So either it crashes or it has to output a value, and these values have to satisfy two different, two additional properties: agreement, which is that all output values are the same. Okay, if they don't have to be the same, it's pretty easy. <laughs> um, and um, validity, the output value of each is the input value of some process. Again, if we don't have validity, we could just say, all right, everybody decides zero always, and it's not interesting. OK. So I mean, with agreement, we could just say, everybody should you know, take your own input value and output it. And then again, it's not interesting. Okay. So this is the consensus problem. OK. All right, so um, no problems with that. OK, so now I want to talk about valency arguments. And um, valency arguments were first introduced uh, in, in order to prove the impossibility of um, solving consensus in um, asynchronous models. And so um, I'll start by giving the, the definitions and a little bit of the, the background for this. So a configuration C is, is said to be V univalent if all executions starting from C output V. 
Okay, so univial it means there's only one possible output, and v, and we put the v in front of it to say that's the only possible output, and we say it's bivalent if there are two executions starting from c that output different values. In particular, let's say zero and one. And output means a single processor or all? Okay, of, no, all some process. The whole process. Yeah, yeah, whatever. Um, I mean, here there presumably would be different processes opening that, and that's not going to happen. I mean, so there's some execution here where. Um, you know, the value zero is output, and if one process outputs zero, then if it's a correct consensus algorithm, any other output has to be zero, and similarly here. So in particular, let's see. Um, so after val some value v has been output, then every configuration is v, v univalent. So no, every other process is going to out some output something has to output v. So the result that we want to prove is that there's no deterministic algorithm to solve consensus among um, two or more processes in an asynchronous system. And this theorem was first uh, proved by Fisher, Lynch, and Patterson in the early 80s. Okay, and this result is often referred to as FLP in their honor. Um, okay, then um, over the uh, related for the subsequent years, a number of uh, different groups of authors uh, presented um, Basically, modify or adapted this algorithm, uh, this uh, proof, to different models, um, and in particular, various shared memory models. And I'm the, the proof of um, the, the proof I'm going to do is in the following model: it's asynchronous shared memory. Processes communicate using read-write registers, and every process is a distinct ID. And at most, n minus one processes can crash. Okay, so we're going to do that, and that happens to be a little bit easier. The, FL, the original um, algorithm by Fisher, Lynch, and Patterson, which was done in a, an asynchronous message passing model, um, has a few additional uh, um, uh, subtleties that we're not going to have to deal with here. Okay, um, so what's the idea of the lower bound, or so this impossibility result? It basically says that an the idea is that an adversary is going to be able to create an infinitely uh, long execution in which no out value is output, and that's, and which would contradict the fact that it solves consensus. Okay, so we're going to have to, um, again, prove two lemmas and, um, and then you combine them to prove the, th the theorem. Okay, so the first lemma is pretty easy, and in fact, it really doesn't depend on the model of computation we're working with. Any, um, any asynchronous model will, will do. Okay, so every consensus algorithm has a bivalent initial configuration. Um, it's, in fact, it works for, consent, uh, for uh, synchronous um, models as well. Okay, so we're going to do a proof by contradiction. Um, and so we'll first we'll assume that all initial configurations are univalent. And we're going to look at, focus in on some of the initial configurations. So let's let C0 be the initial configuration where every process has input 0. And let's let Cn be the initial configuration where every process has input 1. And C1 is a configuration where process 0 has input 1 and all the rest have input 0, et cetera. Okay? So that's formally defined there. Okay. So by validity, okay, uh, we know that C0 is zero univalent and C1, Cn is one univalent. But validity says that you have to output um, some input value. Okay? And since all the inputs are zero starting from C0, um, they have to output zero. And similarly from Cn, they all have to output one. Okay. So what that tells us, if we look along the sequence, there must exist some i such that ci is zero univalent, and the next one, ci I plus one, is one univalent. We have to switch from, remember, all of these are, uh, are univalent. They're either zero univalent or one univalent, because those are the only inputs. Okay, so somehow, someplace we, ha we have a bunch of reds, and somehow, the, at some point, it's going to switch to blue. And we're going to look at the place where that, these two consecutive input configurations um, differ. Okay. So now let's consider any execution. So, so in, what do we know about CI and CI plus one? Well, the only difference is process uh, P sub i, which has input value zero in configuration CI and has input value one in CI plus one. Okay. Now, the idea is if if uh, this process PI crashes before taking any steps, other process can't tell. Okay. So. Um, yeah, to all other processes, CI and CI plus 1 are indistinguishable. And if we look at any execution alpha starting from CI, which doesn't involve a step by process PI, i.e. process PI 
crashes before taking any steps. Um, the, the other processes can't tell. There's no way they can tell the difference between those two, okay? Because it's only, the input for process PI is only stored locally. Okay, so, um, so if the, we look at um, alpha starting from CI, it has, if the other processes have to output zero, but we take that same execution starting from CI plus one, um, they're gonna have to output zero because of indistinguishability, but that violates the, the assumption that CI plus one is one univalent. Okay, so that's a, a, a fairly easy example of, of valency. Okay, so the, the next lemma says that from every bivalent configuration, there is a step that leads to another bivalent configuration, or to a bivalent configuration. Okay? Um, and, okay, so now when we have this, um, what we know is that, um, okay, so now we can prove the theorem. So there's no deterministic algorithm to solve consensus among, um, okay, so let's, so this implies that there's an infinite execution consisting only of bivalent configurations, which violates weight-free termination. Okay, why? Well, the initial config we start with an initial configuration that's bivalent, and we know that exists by lemma one. Okay, by lemma two, from that initial bivalent configuration, we can get to another bivalent con configuration. From that one, we can get to another one. Okay, and we can get to it. There's an infinite sequence of these. Uh, notice that no process is output because once a process is output a value, the configuration is univalent. Okay, so we have an infinite execution and that violates weight-free termination. So it remains to prove lemma two. So to repeat, the reason there's options choices and where it can go is because of the processor or the yeah, but the, yeah, we, so yeah, so what we have, we're this configuration and there are, t I mean, if there are two processes, P0 can take the next step or P1 can take the next step. Yeah, it just, it just chooses, step. yeah. So if we're dealing, since we're trying to construct a bad execution, the, adversar the adversarial scheduler is going to schedule this process, then that one, etc. And so we can, we can get that, yeah. We, Distributed computing is really nice because we have this strong adversary that lets us do all sorts of good things and <laughs> makes my life and every lower bound prover uh, happy. Special year can from now on do just distributed computing lower bound. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Maybe I convince you that there's there, these are pretty and fun. Okay, so that's this is what we want to just prove lemma two. Okay, so. Um, Again, to obtain a con uh, contradiction, suppose there's a bivalent configuration C that all, such that all steps lead to uh, univalent configurations, okay? So here we have um, this, conf this bivalent configuration C and there, um, without loss of generality, let's suppose that the next step by process P0 r results in a, a zero univalent configuration C0 and the next step S1 by process P1 results in a one univalent configuration C1, okay, without loss of generality, otherwise we rename things. Okay, now we're then gonna do a pr uh, proof by cases, okay, and we're gonna get a contradiction in each case. So first of all, let's suppose that steps, uh, let's look at step zero and step one by process P0 and P1, and suppose they access different registers, okay? Um, well, what happens, let's see what happens when we do S0 and then S1 or do S1 and S0, okay? Just do them in opposite orders. Well, in fact, um, since those are two different registers, the results are gonna be exactly the same. We end up in exactly the same configuration. Each process is going to, each of P0 and P1 are gonna have the same states because they're working on different processes they don't interfere with, one, on different registers, so they don't interfere with one another. And if they're writing to them, they're different ones, and so they're not gonna overwrite or interfere with them as well. So the, the values of all the registers are gonna be the same here. Okay, so now let's look at an execution that comes this way. Okay, well, because this is zero univalent, any, this execution is gonna to have to decide zero. But if it comes down here, it's gonna to have to decide one. But the processes can't distinguish between these two, and so this is impossible. Okay, good. All right, suppose that S1, so the steps S0 and S1 are reads of the same register. Okay, so we've, we've dealt with the case when they're accessing different things and they're now accessing the same one. So again, we're gonna get 
at the same situation. If you read first and I read or um, the other way around, it doesn't matter. We're, we don't change anything and we're going to get to the same configuration and we're going to have exactly the same problem. So this can't happen. Okay, so the third case is that they're both accessing the same register and at least one of them is going to write. So let's just say with a loss of generality, S1 writes. Okay, it could be that S0 also writes, I don't care, but it, okay, it doesn't really matter. Okay, so let's look at um, what happens. Okay, um, so um, let's look at these, this configuration, uh, this configuration C1 we get there, and then the configuration C2 when um, process P0 takes its step, and then process P1 takes its step. Okay, now um, what do we know about that? Well, as far as process P1 is concerned, these two configurations are indistinguishable because all it knows is it did its right. Okay, it got back an acknowledgement, so it's fine. And what, about, what do we know about the, the value of the registers? Um, well, it, if, it might be that uh, process P0 read, so it doesn't matter, or it might be that it wrote something that registered, but then um, process P1 overwrote. Um, in step S1. So whatever it is here and here, that register is going to have the same value. Okay? So if we have this execution from here that decides one, okay, it, this is one univalent, so the execution by process P1 from here has got to decide one. It keeps on going until it decides. Um, we can also perform that same execution from here, and it has to decide one because it's indistinguishable to process um, P1, okay, but that violates the, the fact that this is a, um, a zero unit valent configuration. Okay, so in all the cases we've shown, given a, we've contradicted what's happened. Paul? So are you, so you get to assume that an alpha P1 is the only one who is operating? I, all I, I'm, I can, I mean, I'm the adversarial scheduler and I can do that. Um, remember, I'm, so the, the thing that I'm doing here is I'm allowing up to n minus 1 processes to crash. So it's okay. I, uh, this is weight free termination. And so as long as, um, you know, it, it, if it keeps on getting steps, it's going to have to eventually decide or output a value. Um, in the Fisher Lynch and Patterson, that's where some of the, the things uh, happen. Ha they be, you can actually get the same result if even one process, only one process crashes, and, um, and then you ha and you have to worry about some fairness conditions and stuff. So there are lots of other things you can make this result stronger. But I wanted to give you the main idea. Okay, so we've now proved that we have no deterministic algorithm. Okay, in an asynchronous shared memory model, uh, no weight-free uh, consensus algorithm. Okay. Yeah, there were three cases. So what about the three cases? They access different registers. They read the same register, and at least one of them writes to that register. And this without one of them, when one of them writes, this is without lots of generality. Generally, yes, one, yeah. It doesn't matter which one it is. Even if S0 is a write, it wouldn't matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Whether it's a write or a read, it doesn't matter. Because what happens is, whatever this write is, the result of the value in that register, it's the same register, is now going to be fixed by the write to... Um, to that register by process P1. Questions? Okay. Now, consensus can be solved in an asynchronous shared memory system using a, a single compare and swap object. Okay, the basically, it starts with the bottom, the first process uh, does a compare and swap with bottom. Uh, every process tries to do compare and swap with bottom and its input value, and um, all of the, that one gets back at bottom and says, okay, I'll decide my own value, and everybody else gets back that value. So we can do this for any number. And so what this basically set tells us is asynchronous shared memory systems with only registers are less powerful than asynchronous shared memory systems with compare and swap objects and registers. And in fact, real Real systems, um, real distributed systems all have compare and swap objects and, and most of the interesting algorithms actually use compare and swap. But for the purposes of um, the talk and just to keep the model simple, I've sort of ignored all of them and, and we've just focused on read-write registers. But there's a lot, and the valency arguments can be adapted to, um, not to compare and swap objects because obviously you can do that, but other kinds of objects you can show um, can do consensus uh, for some number of processes, but not more. So for example, if you just have something called te a test and set object, it can solve consensus among two processes, but not three, et cetera. Okay, 
a, a Q, if you have a Q, it can solve consensus among two processes, but not three. And so similar kinds of valency arguments can be, can be used there. Um, OK. Um, now, consensus also can be solved using um, randomization. So I mean, consensus is something we want to do. It's really important for distributed computing, so there are lots of ways around it. And these, um, either using stronger shared memory primitives or using randomization are good ways to deal with that. Uh, the statement of the problem is a little bit different. So we, we still have um, agreement and validity, but instead of weight-free termination, we have something called randomized weight-free termination. So each non-faulty process outputs a value after taking expected finite number of steps. So infinite executions are possible, but happen with zero probability. Okay. So um, now there is an algorithm that solves randomized consensus among n processes in which the expected total number of steps taken by all processes, so we're counting all the steps that are taken, is O of n squared. Okay, so this is the step complex, total step complexity. Um, it wasn't that long ago, uh, 10 years ago, that um, Etienne sensor Hillel proved that any algorithm that solves randomized consensus among n processes um, uses omega of n squared expected, uh, um, has expected um, uh, total step complexity omega of n squared. Okay? So they proved that. It uses a valency argument, but a much, much, much more complicated valency argument. And it's not just univalent and bivalent, but there are um, other kinds of things that you have to, other kinds of valencies that come into it, and one has to worry about the probabilities of things happening. And, um, so the, the upper bound in the first paragraph, I mean, this is the same problem that Raven solved in 2 to the n kind of Yeah, so, so this, this algorithm here, which matches their lower bound, in fact, is a very subtle algorithm. It's, it was proved in the same paper. So there are, there are other algorithms that um, are less efficient, but this is the most efficient one in terms of, of um, step complexity. But it's the same problem. There's no change of models and no. optimization. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think, I, if I'm remembering correctly, I think the Rabin was an asynchronous um, randomized algorithm as well. And yeah, I mean the, the same paper, you mean the this, Sophia and Sensei? Yeah, right? this paper here. So it's not that the, uh, I mean, there are lots of algorithms that are easy to randomize that just use registers um, and that I would teach in an under, in a, you know, a beginning uh, a theory of distributed computing, uh, but I would not teach that one. <laughs> but I just wanted to say that that's tight. Okay, um, so the, that's, that's well known. Um, there are also randomized algorithms for consensus and among n processes that use n registers. That other one was much, space complexity was, was bad. Um, and in fact, um, it was only a couple of years ago in stock, um, my PhD student uh, Jimmy proved that any randomized algorithm for consensus among n processes must use um, at least n minus 1 registers. So this is almost tight. I mean, it was very, very close. Um, and this, in fact, um, and this year at Podsy, we presented a, um, an improvement to this. So this, the, the, the result by um, Jimmy in 2016 is a, is a valence. It's a combination of covering arguments and valency. Um, it's, yeah, it, it has some very nice definitions. It's certainly much more complicated than what I presented. It's uh, um, it, it, anyhow. So it, it was there were some really lovely ideas for that, and we were able, but using a very different approach, um, we were able to get rid of the additional one. Uh, that was not the main point of the paper, but it was corollary of that that we can actually show that n is the, t the tight space complexity. Um, one of the things that's interesting, the, the previous best lower bound for space complexity of, of randomized consensus was omega of square root of n. And that was something I did with Morris Herlihy and Nir Shavit um, about, I think, more than 25 years ago. And that, there had been no progress in the mean, essentially no progress in the meantime for that general problem. Um, the, the only thing that's but still open in this, um, is that for that um, result, um, it applied not only to registers, but also when the model included um, some additional things like it, it can include a test and set register objects and a few other kinds of things like that swap. Um, not compare and swap, obviously, but, um, it, and, but this, this, um, this lower bound only applies for registers as does this. 
Okay, and so it's still open where the, the uh, space lower bound when we have more powerful objects um, can be extended. Obviously, with the comparance, like with comparance swap, we can do it with one, one object, and that's easy. The algorithm I gave you before. So that's, a, that's an open question that, that still exists. Okay. Um, uh, there's a question. Oh, question, yes. I think I might, just might have missed it. The order n squared algorithm uses n registers, is that right? No. No, no this, these are, there, there's, there are other algorithms that are much easier. Oh, I see. Yeah. Is there any chance for like a time-space trade-off, maybe? There, yeah, I, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't think people have actually thought about the time-space trade-offs between those. Um, yeah, I mean, there are the, the actual, this actual, okay, we, this lower bound here, um, there's an improvement that says that, um, there's a variant that says, um, Every process has to perform uh, omega of n uh, steps. So there's a, a strengthening of that, which is not overall, but in fact, every process has to have, perform omega of n steps. So they had that um, later on. But in terms of the, the trade off between space and, and time, there ha hasn't been anything that's been considered. So, yeah, that would be your. I'm, yeah, the techniques are fairly different. So I'm not. I, I, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm not sure it would be. I, don't, I wouldn't see an easy way of combining them to get any sort of trade-off. Okay. Um, I want to just mention the last couple of minutes um, one additional problem um, called case set agreement. That's a generalization of consensus. So this is exactly the same in that each process is a private input value vi, and each uh, non-faulty process has to output a value after taking a finite number of steps. Um, validity: the output value of each process is the input value of some process which is exactly the same. The difference is that at most k different values are output. So the case k equals 1 is consensus. The case k equals 2 is the situation where you're in this gourmet restaurant and the chef will only make two different dishes for the, the table and you, everybody at the table has to agree on which uh, main courses they're going to order. Okay, So that would be the case of k equals 2. Um, so this are not very practically motivated problems. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Anyhow, this, ha this problem also has a long history of being studied in theory of distributed computing literature. Um, and there are randomized values. So again, it, it's a generalization of consensus. And so there's not going to be uh, any deterministic <coughs> algorithms, but there are randomized algorithms. Um, for case set agreement among n processes, it uses n minus k plus 1 registers. And the actual um, result, the main result that we proved in the Podsy paper that I was referring to a couple of slides ago was that um, any randomized algorithm for k set agreement among n's processes must use n minus 1 over k plus 1 registers. So there's still a gap from n minus k to n minus 1 over k, so that's a, a big gap. Um, what was nice is that prior to this, the best lower bound was 2. OK, so there's still a big gap, and there are lots of, there are lots of other fundamental problems. Um, I have a book, uh, a monograph. <laughs> Geet, Geet and I have a, a lower bound, a book and all. This is organized by technique, so each chapter is a different technique. And, and uh, there isn't, the only thing was that we didn't put in any uh, communication complexity results there, and presumably in the next version we will. Anyhow, are there any other questions? Thank you. Any other questions? <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you.